For many people, the 20th century used to be known as the American century. However, if we're talking about areas that actually got everyone's attention and focus, I think the 20th century should be far more known as the German century. Today on Geopolitics with Tiberius D, we're talking about the history, the geopolitical history of Germany and how they start started, where they started, where they got to, and what the future might be holding for them. Roll the intro. <laughs> All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, still getting used to some of the new settings. And uh, I'm a little bit off my game today. So um, you, got, you guys know if I'm streaming in the morning, something's wrong. All right, anyway, without further ado, let's get into German geopolitical history. And the good news is now that I have uh, don't have to do the podcast anymore, that we just largely killed that out, I have pictures. And those are always kind of nice because sometimes we don't get to actually explain what's going on here. Okay. So, unironically, where I want to start this story is uh, all the way back with, like, the fall of Rome and all this stuff. Okay, and it's going to be interesting and it's going to be a little weird, but there's a point to this. Okay, back in the olden times, long, long ago, you had Rome, which controlled Italy and France and basically England and Spain and a whole bunch of other areas, right? One of the areas that they didn't control is what, to a large degree, is what we think of as modern Germany. In fact, most of the border that they controlled for the better part of the entire existence of Rome, after basically Caesar conquers Gaul and like in, in the, uh, basically back in the BC era, is um, for the better part of 400 years they will control everything up to the Rhine. So the modern Rhine River, if it is south or west of that, the Romans control it. If they don't, then it's somebody else. The people on the other side are the people that we call today the Germans. Now, there's a little bit of a weird thing here. The Germans are not the same peoples at this point. They are a loose, interconnected, no, not interconnected, they are a loose grouping of people that is Eth somewhat ethnically, but largely linguistically, um, not unified, but uh, of a cultural like zeitgeist. And, and this actually gets really weird when you get to the migration, the Great Migrations, which we're gonna start our story off here with. Um, what you have is a bunch of people who live in the area of Germany and what we and what we now call Poland, that um, largely speak a general similar similar language or language and language structure they have a somewhat similar uh cultural group but they are these different peoples uh you know and you have goths and visigoths and you have franks and saxons and angles and all these other people um but what will happen is that in the early 300s is that most of them will have to start moving around and this is called the great migration it's caused by two things number one is a climate shift that makes the uh, makes the era a little bit colder uh, and it's not by much but it's enough to really screw up global weather weather patterns and to a point where people really start wanting to move around and of course with one migration usually comes another and then another and another because it's basically once somebody picks up and leaves they run into somebody and either they have to pick up and leave or the people have to keep on going and so with the rise of people like the huns is that eventually the North, the North European plain to a large degree, to a large degree has this giant phase of picking up and moving West or South or both. And so you have the rise of about, you know, by the time that you get to the three hundreds, particularly the mid three hundreds is, uh, you have a bunch of people who largely just pick up and leave and you have Saxons, you have Franks, Angles, uh, Visigoths, Goths, Lombards, all these other peoples, uh, are all these peoples, Basically, just pack them and leave because either one, somebody is coming in and trying to take over their lands, or two, is that uh, their lands really don't even suit them anymore. And so they're picking up and they're trying to take off. Uh, what eventually you'll have is the basically the decline and fall of the Western Roman Empire. The Lombards will largely take um, 
excuse me, largely will take northern Italy. You'll have the the Goths and the Visigoths take over most of Spain. You'll have the Angles and the uh, the Jutes, and um, the Saxons will more or less occupy southern England. Although most of the Saxons will stay in northern Germany, uh, and then you'll have the people called the Franks, which I bet, excuse me, I, I get, or, yeah, I bet you can't guess where they went. Anyway, our story is going to actually start more off with the Franks because German and French history have a lot in common at this time. And unironically, the basically the peoples that will kind of become the rulers of the German people will actually be the Franks for quite a long time. So our first graphic here is to kind of just to show uh, where we're at here and what I'm talking about. So this is the... Uh, Kingdom of the Franks, and they largely start in the areas of central, uh, in central uh, Germany. And at this point, it's not a great place even today to really, you know, build out a major geopolitical entity. Um, and eventually, what will happen is the Franks will largely cross the Rhine, and they'll start coming into the areas around Aachen and Metz and Tunari, um, which today is southern Belgium. And they'll come in. Oh, hold on here. I'm using the wrong display. Pardon me on that. Let's try that. Oh no, I goofed up my thing again. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? Um, and now my thing is screwed up. How dare I? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, still getting over some of the stuff. And again, morning streams don't usually work for me that well. And okay, there we go. All right, so let's uh, let's knock this out. So they they come into this general northern area. And they take over what is um, basically the areas of Lorraine and Flanders to a large degree. And they'll they'll kind of make that their home. Eventually, you'll have the rise of the Merovingians. And we'll, we talk about this a lot in the French history. And when we redo it, we'll definitely talk about it again. But in a general sense here, the Merovingians come in. They take over the areas that is Italy de France and Normandy. And they'll eventually take over uh, modern areas of northern France. And then uh, the successor will largely come in and take over Aquitaine and a few other places. Um, what this largely does is that it brings out the modern um, people, basically the modern lands of what we call France. Now, uh, there is a lot to be had here. I'm skipping over this because we're talking about Germans, right? The reason why we talk so much about the French is that this is all going to lead up to a guy named Charlemagne. You may know him very much. Um, what is going on here is that the Franks, Char Charlemagne is known as Charles the Great or Carl the Great in German. And the reason why is that he is by all determined, by all means German. And this is where you really have a society. Uh, good morning, Silver Reaver. Good to see you. This is where you have a, uh, societies that are still linguistically and culturally not unified, but largely, um, brethren. And there's a lot of things that you can see in, in the French language and the German languages that still today interconnect. They are still in some ways related. Uh, remind you that for all of the talk about, you know, race and ethnicity and all that, whatnot, a lot of Europeans do have a lot of common ancestries that all kind of boil down into very Germanic very uh, or very Latin. Uh, and a lot of those still got blended together with uh, the Great Migrations and what have you. And so... Um, you know, European history, not quite as polarized as some people should make, try to make it out to be. Anyway, let's get off that boat. What I am getting at here, and more particularly in, more particularly in what's going on, is that the Franks will slowly build up and come to dominate most of the Germanic peoples as we know them. And you will have the Empire of Charlemagne. And on this map is the, everything consolidated into the Red Line. So you'll have territories in Spain, or modern Spain, all the way up into central Germany and Austria, uh, and most of Italy. All right, so what's the big deal here? Why are all these people's Germans, and why are the borders of Germany so screwed up now? Well, with Charlemagne, is that you have basically the, the pinnacle of German power as it is there. Most of the people within Spain and who go into southern Italy or what have you, uh, will largely become other people. They, they, they will integrate into the societies, uh, so you'll eventually get the rise of the Spanish, and you'll get the rise of the Berbers and all these other folks that went south. You'll have the 
the Angles and the uh, the Jew, the Angles and the Saxons will eventually become the English, which will eventually become the English. And we, when we do the history there, we'll talk about how they slowly kind of de-Germanify in some way to become their own people. But you, if you actually study English and German, you'll realize there's a lot in common with these languages, and they haven't gone that far away. Uh, what largely happens between the French and the Germans is that over the better part of a thousand years is that they are going to split off as functional entities. And to give you another example here, the area known as Frisia, which is now Holland or the Netherlands, whatever you want to call, will even go its own way because you can listen to Dutch and it sounds very German and honestly it is very German, but they develop their own independent ideal of what, who they are and what, how they operate. And so even when you have a large central authority or a large central unif unified entity is that eventually those usually break down and even the peoples that largely once thought of themselves as the same people uh, in some regards will eventually break down and you'll have these splinterings and um, splinterings and reunifications. It's all very weird. Um, and I, I say this weird as in hot or basically this. History is like a bunch of waves. You have one wave that comes in, kind of takes over the area. You have one wave that comes out and it'll like split it apart. And so you'll have people that will come in and they'll integrate together and become a new people. Sometimes they will integrate with others and become a greater people. History is just fun and interesting. Uh, and a lot of the times when people put it into context that people are their own people, they're full of shit. But also on the other side of that is that when people say that everybody is completely different, they're largely full of shit too. And so, um, um, yeah, it's just one of those deals where like humanism meets like ethnocentrism in a, in a weird way. And everybody is completely wrong and completely right all at the same time. It's all strange. Um, but I'm going to get off that horse. Okay. So what largely happens is Charlemagne eventually becomes, and he has the great empire of, you know, he's Carl the Great. And so... Most of the, most of the Germanic peoples, the Lombards, Franks, and the peoples that are the Saxons, are largely integrated into one empire. Two problems. Th two pro things happen. One, um, the French throne at this point, which is known as Francia, is a um, gavel kind uh, throne. Ever center a year now, not before. We'll definitely get into that as we go through history. Okay. So anyway. Uh, the, fr the, 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 excuse me, the throne of Francia is uh, a gavel kind. And so any time that there are multiple sons, the empire gets split up and the, and the dominions pass between multiples. Now, a good thing is, uh, Charlemagne only has one surviving kid. So it passes on to him. And I can't remember, I think it's Louis, but I can't remember for sure. But eventually what will happen is, is that Charlemagne's grandkids, there's three of them, and the empire gets split completely apart. You'll have West Francia, which will largely become France, and that is the people that will largely develop into the French people. That is largely the areas of Italy de France, and that will become the core of France. And you'll also have the, what used to be the Kingdom of Aquitaine. In the middle is the area that we kind of call Lotharingia, and this is... Um, Largely centered around the Champagne region and the region of Burgundy. And you can see Burgundy here on this map to a large degree. Is that uh, it is the central area of this uh, empire. The area known as East Francia will eventually be reclassified into the Holy Roman Empire. And we're going to get there here in a second. But here's the key detail. In, eight, in 800 AD, Charlemagne is crowned the first Holy Roman Empire and it's re Holy Roman Emperor and it's really weird because basically while this uh, entity is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire is that largely this is supposed to be the Germanic successor to Rome and when you control Rome you get a nice little claim to this okay so here's the here's the real uh, rub here Charlemagne has this great empire, becomes what is now known, what is known as the Holy Roman Empire to some degree. The problem is, is that once he dies, some of the fervor goes away with that, and once the empire is split up, no one technically has the full right to owning the empire, and so it basically goes on default for a while. Well, eventually what will happen about 100, 100, 150 years later is that you'll have the rise of a guy named Otto, and he will take East Francia, which, you know, I can't remember if he's actually an inheritor of Charlemagne. I don't think he is. 
Um, I think the Carolingians die out at this point. But he'll get the throne of East Francia, and he will reinstate the Holy Roman Empire, and that is where we get to this particular next slide. And this is um, the Holy Roman Empire about 1000 AD, so 300 years after the big map. Mostly, this is a Germanic entity, and the, one of the things that you'll notice here is that it's getting more into the normal borders of what we think of. Um, so there's two things I want to make out here. West Francia, you can see here, is the Kingdom of France and that is formed. What has largely happened is the area known as Lotharingia doesn't survive very long because its geopolitical borders don't work where the crap. So all of these green areas here are on the le or on the left hand side and the Kingdom of Burgundy, it couldn't maintain its independence and ends up getting swallowed up largely by uh, Otto and company. What happens to the east is that you have Bohemia and Austria and a lot of places that will eventually be known as Brandenburg. Those areas weren't German whenever, um, excuse me, when um, Charlemagne was around. Those areas actually weren't German. They were tributary states of the areas of people that we call the Slavs. What, have, what happened was is that the Germans basically started going on crusade about this point. And, uh, you know, the, they are Christians, the Slavs are basically these filthy heathenist pagans, uh, and they start largely just marching into the areas of uh, Central, and Eastern, or Central and Eastern Germany uh, and Central and Eastern Europe and basically start conquering them. And so you have this wish-wash where a lot of these people had come from Central and Eastern Europe and migrated there, but now they're migrating back! Uh, and it's, it's one of these weird things throughout history. You just see, way, you literally see the waves of history where people pick up and move, and then they'll pick back up and move again, and, and they'll interact, and they'll completely change the dynamic. And so you'll have Franconia and the Saxons, and all, all these peoples pick up, move, move over here, and then they'll readapt and re become a new people here. And so by the time you get to conrad and otto and whatnot you have what is the holy roman empire which is weird because on this map you can see that there's all these subdivisions when the holy roman empire largely forms under otto the first is that or it, this is the second holy roman empire ironically enough but when it reforms it is a far more constructed and far more um what's the word i want to use here it's a far more unified entity this time um and so this gets really weird really quick because the Holy Roman Empire is one of these weird um, kind of antitheses in history where most of the time you have this small like d d confederation that collects over time. The Holy Roman Empire is actually the exact opposite. It's this large conglomeration that has an authoritarian central autocratic ruler under Otto that is, an, that is basically a, um, what's the word I want to use here? Uh, it's a, a firm autocrat that will control uh, the entity. And it, there'll be a um, an absolute monarch uh, whenever uh, this largely starts out. But as the empire gets older, it actually decentralizes. And you'll get the rise of the numerous, numerous states and principalities of the Holy Roman Empire. We're going to be talking about that here as we go on. Uh, Clovis, the first king of France. Yeah, he was cool. Uh, we talked about the Merovingians a little bit. I don't know if you were listening. But uh, yeah, we're kind of past that, unfortunately. Uh, do check out the France episode. We do have the old history episode, and we'll be recording a new one. Too, not too terribly long. Next episode's Fran or Poland, though. Okay, so let's get off of that mess. Okay, so the Germans start going back into Central and Eastern Europe, and they're basically between crusading and a little bit of just call basically what we would largely call colonization. They start moving into areas that are more German now than they are, they are at this point. Um you also have the Lombards that are part of this in northern Italy. There's a reason why it always gets split right where it does, is that the Lombards come in and they largely take over northern Italy, and to the south they'll largely be their own people that are largely holdovers from the Latin people to a large degree. Um, we'll have to talk about this in Italian history when we get back to Italy, but the long and the short here is that north Italy and south Italy have a lot of differences. Okay. Table that. We're talking about Germany. Uh, Germany is largely this unified entity under the Holy Roman Empire, under Otto and Conrad, but eventually it starts breaking down. And you see 
all the divisions within this already. You have the Duchy of Lorraine and Swabia and Bavaria, and you'll actually have these newer areas that'll pop up, such as Bohemia, Moravia, and Austria, and Brandenburg, or Austrike, if you will. Uh, and this is why it's called, Austrike is called the Eastern Kingdom, is that this was one of the frontiers of the area at the time. And this is the shaded area that that'll uh, that you can see here. And so over the period of quite a while, you'll see the Germans migrating more and more east into Central Europe, as to a large degree, into areas that we'll eventually call Poland uh, and Hungary and whatnot. And uh, you will see the transformation of the Holy Roman Empire. And by 1500, this is what we have. Uh, and you'll definitely see that the levels of balance, the levels and changes of balance of power absolutely completely goes to hell. Um, now, granted, this is when the Protestant Reformation is start, starting to take off, and so you've got religious differences here and geopolitical differences. Uh, and to a large degree, here's the highlight reel, if you want. Some people, or some of these institutions will break down because of what we call Gavilkind's secession, and that is whenever the ruler dies, all of his kids inherit, and all, or basically a lot of these titles break apart and break apart and break apart. And sooner or later, they'll get into... Uh, what is called um, promogeniture. Uh, and promogeniture is that the oldest son inherits. And so whenever the king comes out and actually is able to annex an area and bring it back into the kingdom, is that with promogeniture, it stays within the ranks. And so some of these areas start collecting power and, and start collecting geopolitical influence and are able to hold together in these feudal and medieval dynasties that are able to build them up into something constructive. Some of them are far more successful than others. Bavaria does okay for a bit, then it crashes, then it tries to come back again. The breakaway peoples here that we'll be getting into, uh, to a large degree, are four. Number one is the, uh, the Netherlands, which is the Dutch. They will largely try to break away at this, or this is about the point where they start trying to break away from the or from the Holy Roman Empire and basically the what we will call the German Confederation because they are start getting to the point where they don't really see themselves as German anymore. Uh, and particularly whenever you get the rise of the Protestants in Northern Germany, the Dutch will largely become Protestant, um, which gets really weird because the Southern Dutch actually be, still remain Catholic. And it's just, we'll get to there whenever we do Dutch history. But in a large degree, uh, just putting this all together, you have the Dutch going in their own way, and then you have three other main or main contenders here, and they're in the east. The first one is Austria. You can see that there in orange on the bottom. They will largely be... Uh, the, they are the Archduchy, and the reason why they will control so much, the Austrian Netherlands and Lutzburg and uh, Burgundy, is that uh, the Habsburgs get really strong come about 1400. Uh, they're able to just keep... They're one of the first peoples to actually in, enact primogeniture. And so when the Archduchy of Austria starts to collect itself, is that every time it annexes something, it keeps it. And so you have what will eventually become the Empire of Austria. And 1500, you know, Austria is starting to really get it, but it'll be the, in the 1500s is where the Austria goes from Archduchy, or Archduchy of moderate size of importance to being super empire of Central and Eastern Europe. We'll get there in here in just a second. Okay. In a nutshell, Bohemia is the next one. Bohemia is actually not German. They're, they're kind of Germanified in some way, but these are the peoples that we now call the Czechs. Uh, they, they get a lot of cultural influences and a lot of uh, things that actually will pour over from the Germanic peoples, but they don't quite adopt or become German in their own way. They're somewhat colonized or somewhat integrated. Uh, and actually, the Holy Roman capital for a while will be Prague, but to um, but to a, a large extent is that the Bohemians, which will eventually become the Czechs, don't really see themselves as full Germans, but they participate in the systems as as it means because they don't have a lot of other friends. But to a large degree, Czechs are weird because they used to be Slavic peoples, but now they're kind of in this weird spot where they're not quite Slavic and they're not quite German, and so. Bohemian history, or if you will, Czech history, very strange. And uh, it gets into one of those weird identity things where, you know, you just, you're your own people and there's a reason why you're your own people. The last people that we're going to talk about here is Brandenburg, and that's in the green. Uh, they will uh, be one of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire. 
For a very long time, they are basically just like any of the other states. They are barely going anywhere. They're not, they're, you know, they'll have some rise and some falls, but they're nothing like Bohemia or Austria in the way that they're really putting everything together cohesively and in, in, into a geopolitical entity that will te- that will last the test of time and, and become a force of, uh, excuse me, become a force of nature here. That'll change about the 1600s. And let me just double check this real quick. Yeah, 1792 uh, will be the next one that we're getting at. What What's going on with Austria, or what, what happens in Eastern Europe is three things. One, uh, the crown of Bohemia and Hungary eventually gets united in a personal union. I believe this is from the Hungarian king. And so Hungary and Bohemia are basically a personal union that becomes a juggernaut in Central Europe. This is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly, in, uh, excuse me, incredibly important to maintaining the stability of Central Europe. Problem is the Hungarians are fighting the Ottomans, and uh, you know the Ottomans are you know really only picking up uh, steam at this point, but they're getting incredibly strong and they're becoming incredibly wealthy very very quickly, because it's only in fourteen like fifty three or fourteen fifty six the Constantinople is sacked. By the time you get to the 1500s, they're, you know, they're charging up into the kingdom of Hungary. So, you know, this ball's rolling and it's rolling quick. What will eventually happen, I think this is in 1517, I have to double check, might be a little later, is that the king of Bohemia, Hungary, dies in battle against the Ottomans. And his first inheritor is the Archduke of Austria. So all of a sudden, the throne of, or the throne of Hungary and Bohemia are all consolidated into the Archduchy of Austria. And all of a sudden you've got a massive geopolitical juggernaut that is now known as the Austrian Empire. And it's weird because you have the Holy Roman Empire, which is made up of all of these little vassal states containing technically another empire, which is the Austrian Empire. It's all very confusing and all very weird. And basically by this point, the, the Holy Roman Empire is more or less this loose confederation that has broken up in all these different entities that is more of a confederation than an empire at this point. Uh, it is largely tributary. Whoever is the, uh, excuse me, whoever is the leader of this, and it's usually Austria after about 1450, or I think it's actually exclusively Austria after 1450, excuse me, is um, largely its tributary state. Everyone own, or sends a bit of manpower, sends a little bit of money to the emperor in forms of protection. It's very feudal in that regard, but as it goes along, independence or more self-determination and autonomy breaks away for each and every state. And so by the time we get to the Napoleonic Wars in the 1700s, which we're moving into now, everybody's kind of going their own or their own way. So... This map's a little confusing. Oh, it's raining. Quite a lot, actually. Um, You can see here in the orange, this is the Austrian Empire that you can see uh, that it's largely united together. Uh, Salzburg is lost its independence. It's just kind of sitting there on the map. Uh, The Netherlands have, or or the United Netherlands, but they are kind of this weird entity. They've broken away. They're not really part of of the Holy Roman Empire at this point although they still say they are, uh, but they absolutely disagree with everybody in the empire. Um, the Austrian Netherlands uh, is here. I don't this, I don't think this map is right. Anyway, forget it. Okay, here's the real thing that, that we're talking about in this general era. Through the 1600s, uh, through the 1500s, Austria comes to dominate the Holy Roman Empire, uh, and they will largely help fight the 30 Years' War which is the fight between Catholics in the South and Protestants in the North. That will go for some time, and eventually what you'll have is the combination of France and Sweden will largely help the Protestants win and separate themselves both figuratively and literally from the Catholics in the South. And this basically is more or less the final death blow of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, it'll exist technically for another 200 years on paper, but in practice, it's pretty much game over. And so, basically, by 1650, to a large degree, the Holy Roman Empire is basically a sham of its former self. There is technically a lot of politics that go into it, but the Austrians always run it. Everyone who disagrees is going to try to find any way and every way to get away out, out from under the authority of that. Thank you for the um, follow. Appreciate that. Um, 
And so you have basically a Protestant North versus a Catholic South, which will find some large terms that they can largely operate on, and you'll have the rise of a new state. This state is largely Prussia, and uh, this takes a, it takes a lot of different um, forms. The first form that it would take was the Margrave of Brandenburg. That was the little green one that we saw on the map earlier there that was largely in that little center chunk of uh, around Berlin. That area was largely geopolitically unstable. It doesn't have the best um, doesn't have the best resources. Doesn't have really any kind of security. But what happens is, is about 1650 is that a the von Hohenzollerns come into power there, and uh, they're just they're from central uh, central or southern Germany, basically the area around Frankfurt. Uh, they come up and uh, through some dynastic claims, they're able to become. The rulers of the small, um, excuse me, the rulers of the small enclave in northern Germany, but they are very proficient. They are very technocratic, and what eventually largely happens here is that the Margrave of Brandenburg starts collecting significant amounts of power, and uh, what what really the uh, von Hohenzollerns are known for is that they are very much administrators and they're very much good on their martial policy. They turn the Margrave of Brandenburg into a significant military power of its era. It's not strong at first, but they slowly train and build up to become a very professional fighting force, even though they're small. And whenever they get a chance to geopolitically assert themselves, they largely will do so. Um, their, their only real rateness here is their diplomatic matters. Um, excuse me. I have no idea what's going on in chat, but okay. Anyway, uh, what's largely going on here is that anytime that they get a chance, they'll largely be pushing themselves forward. It's not necessarily exactly the best things that they're going to be doing because their diplomacy kind of sucks. Um, and they'll sometimes have to play off the Poles or the Swedes or what have you, but eventually they start building up into something strong. Uh, at the same time, there is an exclave over in Poland called Prussia. It's largely a remnant of the Teutonic Knights, which were peoples that were campaigning and crusading into areas of northern Poland and into Lithuania that are very German. And so they basically colonized what is now today northern, the northern half of Poland. Uh, and this will eventually be known as Prussia writ large. We'll talk about that in a, a little bit. But to a large degree, um, anyone who isn't converted... Uh, and the Poles and the Lithuanians eventually will be converted into Catholicism, is that all these peoples will eventually be colonized and become Germans to a large degree, particularly the peoples we now call the Prussians. Okay, anyway, what happens is uh, there is a breakaway province within Poland called Prussia. It's largely a client state of the Poles, but um, they largely have people who are uh, ruling it in their stead. And one of the, eventually what happens is the von Hohenzollern actually gets control of Prussia. And uh, basically the, it'll stay within the family. So you'll have one, one von Hohenzollern running Brandenburg, another one that's running Prussia. Eventually Prussia is able to one, break away from Poland as more or less its own complete entity. And also you will have a combining of the families. I, I believe one of the one of the branches dies off, and I think it's the one from Brandenburg, but don't quote me on that, where the Prussian side of the family is able to unite all the, the realms under a personal union, and you will eventually have uh, the Mar the Margrave of Brandenburg, Prussia. This lasts for a quick minute, not really too important, but eventually what you'll have is by, seven, what is it, 1700, 1701, you will have the... Prussians, or you'll have this family line, could petition the Holy Roman Empire for kingship because they have started building out a significant, you know, borders of their, or, excuse me, a significant kingdom that is becoming powerful enough where they're like, hey, look, we're not a duke, we're not a duke anymore. I, I should be a king. And um, I can't remember what the political deal is, but the long story short, they eventually get it. And so you have an emperor and a king, all within the technically the whole early Roman Empire, and uh, you have the kingdom of Prussia form. Prussia is no joke, and after, over a period of time, it will build up and build up and build up to become a major entity in the north of the country. And by 1792, everything that is in blue on this map will be largely ruled directly or indirectly by the Prussians. 
This is not a quick thing. It will take the better part of 200 years to get here. But by the time they are able to consolidate all of this into a political entity, it's strong. And keep in mind, during the 1750s, you have uh, the uh, the War of Austrian Secession and you have the Seven Years' War, uh, which is basically the continuation of that 20 years later, and which Prussia is largely allied with England, and they're up against Russia, the Austrians, and France, and they're able to go toe-for-toe toe with them, and Frederick the Great, which is known for very particular reasons, uh, during the War of Austria's Secession, he's able to take this area here known as Silesia. It is one of the richest parts of all of Europe, and it really helps boost Prussia. When Prussia finally gets a chance to finally go down in a knockdown, drag out fight, they're completely outnumbered, they're completely outgunned. But Frederick the Great, during the Seven Years' War, will go eight for eight. So he'll lose eight battles, he'll win eight battles, and Prussia won't literally lose anything. They won't gain anything either but they will consolidate their geopolitical entity into the kingdom of Prussia that you see on this map. We're going to get into the 1800s at this point, and that gets into the Confederation of the Rhine, and uh, that gets into uh, the German Confederation. We're going to stop that for a second. We're going to talk about this nice little video here, um, and what we're looking at is uh, a quick little lowdown of where the um, German... This is the Holy Roman Empire, and you'll, you can see how it changes over time we're not going to watch the whole video i'm just going to skip a few moments here but you can see that it'll pick up some areas and it'll gain some areas as the germans largely move east and uh, it will lose areas in the west to the influence of france and to breakaway areas in the south that are largely the italians and so as this time goes on basically the germans move east uh, but they lose their power of the peoples that really aren't germany more particularly in italy and particularly in france and so you can see some of this go on. You'll have the Thirty Years' War and all these other things go on. Um, hey, there you go. You can see uh, the United Provinces of the Netherlands trying to break away. Quite a lot of what I, all the history I talked about. And so eventually you'll get to largely the modern borders of Germany uh, by the end of the Holy Roman Empire uh, writ large. And of course you get the Napoleonic Wars in the end in 1806 formally uh, as Francis completely uh, destroys the throne. So we'll get rid of that there cool okay what eventually happens is that you have the rise of the napoleonic wars and the end of the holy roman empire in full in or in full measure this leaves the germans in a little bit of a weird stretch because they have all of these different peoples that still kind of think of themselves as a united people and this is getting into the area where nationalism starting to take off but they don't know what to, wow it is really pouring they don't really know necessarily what they're going to do about it. Uh, and so you have the Confederation of the Rhine under Napoleon, which is basically a German client state that controls most of, su or of uh, central and uh, southern modern Germany. Austria isn't pulled into this, and Prussia isn't pulled into this, but to a large degree, this area here, all of this area in, this area in southern Germany today is pulled into the confederation of the rhine and it's a german client state it actually works pretty well for napoleon the problem is that eventually he loses and um you get this uh you get this map uh most of the eastern provinces of prussia weren't originally prussian and is largely given to them because no one else knows how to rule it or has the strength to really assert themselves into it so prussia largely gets it and so about 1821 this is the map and the reason why this says 1815 is, well, formally, this is what's given over after the wars all or Napoleonic wars are over. This takes a lot of negotiating, and it isn't really formally done until the Congress of Vienna or the Congress uh, or the Concert of Europe in Vienna in 1821. Okay, cool. This is eventually the map, and you have a few major powers here. You have the Saxonies back again, the Kingdom of Hanover, which is actually uh, protected by the British. Uh, because it's under a personal union of them until 1837. Uh, but you also have Mecklenburg, Holstein, Schwedzleg, uh Also, um, Bavaria is quite powerful here. But eventually what happens is, is that you have the Confederation, uh, or the German Confederation. This is just basically a thing saying, hey, we're all Germans here, and if anything actually really happens bad to Germany, we'll all band together, we'll all go kick somebody's ass. In, re actually, in real reality, this isn't really much of a thing. And honestly, this just breaks down into a net massive geopolitical struggle between the Austrians and the Prussians and who is going to eventually become the great rulers of Germany itself. Um, 
outside of this map, you can see these northern areas here. This is the areas of Prussia to a large degree. Uh, and this is confusing. The land of Prussia and the kingdom of Prussia are two different things. Uh, basically, all the lands of Prussia are now part of Poland. Uh, what is now the kingdom of Prussia will eventually form Germany, which we're going to get into. Okay. So, I gave away the plot in case you didn't know history, but eventually Prussia is going to win this. Is that they're going to go into a conflict with Austria. It's going to be a lot of political maneuvering, and you have the rise of a man named Otto von Bismarck. Um, and basically after the, re out of the revolutions of the 1840s and 50s, you'll get into a very unstable Europe and the rise of nationalism where you have the Germans, whether they're in Bavaria or Prussia or Hanover, largely now consistently see themselves as a united German people, but they have to put that into practice. And of course, a lot of these old rules don't apply. <sighs> Prussia and Austria eventually just get into a headbutting fist over this. The problem here is twofold. One, Austria cannot decisively defeat the Prussians and, and usurp power over them because Prussia's no joke. They've got pretty much the best army in Europe at this point. They are, um, you know, relatively a well-run state. And the problem with Prussia is that they would love to incorporate Austria into a greater Germany but the problem is most of the Austrian Empire is in German, and no one wants to rule the un-German parts. They would rather them be independent. So, basically the long story short here is that Prussia can't force the issue permanently on Austria, and Austria can't force the issue permanently on Prussia. What the Prussians eventually decide to do is that they'll literally just pull anyone who isn't Austrian into a greater German state, and this eventually leads to the Brothers' War in 1866, which is why this map ends here, where Prussia and Austria go to war. And all the German states pick sides. Some of them will side with Prussia, some of them will side with Austria, most will side with Austria. But Prussia allied with what is now the New Kingdom of Italy, which has really just formed in the last 10 years, is going to go up against Austria. And Prussia will do most of the legwork here, but Prussia will decisively defeat Austria in the better part of a month. Um, and with that, excuse me, with the rise of this is that you get the North German Confederation and which leads us to this next particular map. North German Confederation is everything within blue. Um, there's a few states that will be allied to them. That is Saxony and mecklenburg uh, which is some of these states up here in the north. But basically everything that's blue and everything that's uh, above this line here of these three states is going to be formally integrated into... Uh, control of the Prussians, whether directly or indirectly. Uh, the reason why we have this map is that what ha what this is is the German Wars of Unification. The first thing that you have, and I, I kind of didn't talk about this in the last map, is that Schleswig and Holstein are controlled by the Danes at this point. And the Danes are going to try to annex the Holstein outright and bring it into their empire as formally. Prussia doesn't like this, and basically, with a political, little bit of political maneuvering, they go to war with Denmark. They formally defeat them in a war, and I think this is 1865, 1866, as uh, they're able to formally beat them in a couple of months. Uh, not just too long after that, the um, and, and actually the Austrians help. Uh, what eventually happens, though, is that the Austrians get one province, the Prussians get another, and the Prussians basically instigate a war between them and the Austrians over who's going to run the show. Prussia wins. Um, yeah, Prussia just definitively wins here. Um, they'll, they'll force pretty much anyone who sided against them and uh, in the war formally just annexing in them into the North German Confederation. Anyone who's still allied with, the, with them will basically become a former protect, formal protectorate within the, within the Confederation. And so while you have all these dotted maps, basically everything north, formerly under the control of the Prussians, and now it's basically North Germany. A few years later, and this is not very long, you have um, Prussia go for broke on con getting everybody else in, or excuse me, everybody else within Germany who is in Austria into the Union. And the way that they do that is they maneuver the French into declaring war against the Germans, particularly Prussia. And it scares the living hell out of the southern Germans. Because they're afraid that France is going after them. And with a little political maneuvering on the part of Bismarck, he ba he largely baits the French in declaring war. Prussia absolutely manhandles the French. 
And uh, what you'll largely have is that basically as soon as the French declare war, um, the three major states that are still left, which is Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria, all basically come into the fold as Confederate as uh, states of the Confederation, uh, or the New German Federation, and they come in and they just participate all as a unified German army, and they crush France, absolutely crush them. In the better period of four months, the Germans will win a massive decisive victory over France in the Franco-Prussian War, and formally unite uh, Germany in 1871. Uh, and I believe it's actually on New Year's Day, January January 1st, 1781, the Empire of Germany is founded. What largely is the political institution here is that they all pay subservience to what used to be the German, or excuse me, the Prussian king, which is now the German Kaiser. Some of the people is that are um, basically the princes of the areas. This is the places that had allied themselves to Prussia or had joined in uh, whenever the franco prussian War started. They will be their own entities, as in you'll have Bavaria, Württemberg, the, the, whoever is the crown prince or whoever, they'll be able to maintain their titles. But once they tend to die, what, what the Prussians largely will say is like, hey, look, you can keep your titles, you can keep all the all the aristocracy things, but you're going to become formal entities within the Prussian state. We might redraw some borders. You still have a significant amount of power, but you are now part of Germany. And so uh, I don't have a states map here that will eventually form out, but largely by 1890, Germany is a formal German empire in which you get this map um and that is incredibly powerful so this is modern germany that we think of now it is finally formed uh, i don't think i need this map at all um this area here is uh Auslaus and lorraine these are the borderlands between the french and the germans we're going to talk about this when it comes to world war one and war two is that um in a general sense here, this is the borderland between the two, and France and Germany love to fight over who gets control of this because, tell me what, Strasbourg right now is within France? Does Strasbourg sound French to you? It's more German. Uh, Metz is actually a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more French, but it's actually, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to table that. Okay, Germany, German Empire. Forms in 1871, we already talked about that. What is the problem with Germany? Two things. Number one is strong. <laughs> okay, we're talking about a nation that even disunited to some degree is absolutely manhandles France in four months. And had, you know, this is just four years after they beat the living hell out of the Austrians. This state is strong. It is militarily competent. It can kick a lot of ass. And once it's uni unified into a full geopolitical entity and it's unright, it just goes on escape velocity. This is during the age of the Industrial Revolution. So they're building railroads and they're building factories and they're building all these things that are part of the normal, or what we normally now think of as Germany. The big industrial plants, the, you know, basically the you know, strong contingent of workers and the technological expertise. This is all built out on the German Empire. And Germany just gets wealthy and strong and powerful. And basically... In a nutshell, you have this new kid on the block that is Germany, that is in the direct center, is surrounded by enemies on all sides or people that are potential rivals on all sides, and can literally two for one the next two biggest contenders on the continent at the same time. Germany is just no joke. It is strong. It is uber. It is just ridiculous. And so what you have is an era of political containment and political realignment. Basically, as soon as Germany forms, it scares the living hell out of everybody, and Ger the relationship rapidly becomes what it, it unironically is the German question. I hate to put it in that returns, but it is. Are you either as are you a friend of Germany, in which Germany largely supports you and will help you, or are you an enemy of Germany where you're scared shitless of them and you're getting you're finding friends to help it contain them. Uh, what happens is, is that eventually Bismarck gets too old and one of the, one of the kings who comes, or the, one of the Kaisers that comes up doesn't like him and eventually ousts him from power as we're at large. And this is uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, which will lead Germany into World War II. He's kind of a dipshit, uh, if I'm being completely honest. Now, it's not to say that he is completely inept, but largely he's got an inferiority complex because of a number of things. 
And basically, he doesn't like anybody who seems to be more competent than him. And so uh, a number of generals here and a number of administrators here, they'll all either be weeded out or forced into retirement. And while Germany will largely still be competent, because Wilhelm's not stupid himself, is that the problem is that anyone who is more competent than him is largely forced out of power. And so Germany will enter uh, the, the 1900s, not gimped, but largely will be not at its full potential that it needs to be, particularly among its diplomatic corps. And I don't know why this is a thing about Germans, but Germans, the only good diplomat that Germans ever had was Otto von Bismarck. I don't know why, but they're just not good at it. Uh, talk to the Germans. They, they need to work on that kind of thing. Anyway. What happens here is that Bismarck told everybody in which people wouldn't listen that you the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want the Russians and the French on the same damn team. Keep one of them on your side. If Germany's allied to Russia, which is completely doable, you're fine. If Germany can get along with France, which was probably never going to happen, you'd be fine. But having them on the same side is bad because that means Germany has to fight on two fronts. And that's particularly really bad because look at how big that border is with the Russian Empire. Largely what Bismarck said was just make sure to be friends with the Russians if, when it at all possible. Uh, what, what the other side of this was is that Germany and the Austrians didn't get along very well because basically Germany said that they were the better Germans. And the Austrians were like, well, we were here first. The problem is the Austrians aren't really that German because while Austria is German, most of the other provinces of the empire are not. Bohemia is Czech. Slovakia is Slovakian. Um, what is this? Ruthania is Hungarian. Um, what is this? Galicia is Polish. Hungary, which controls half the empire, or half of their empire technically, is made up of Hungarians and Croats and Slovenians and all these other damn people. Um, and if that sounds racist, that, uh, that mean, doesn't mean to be. I'm just talking about like this. This is a huge multi-ethnic multi-ethnic squash potch that doesn't agree on how it is and while germany is united as hey it's ethnocentrism and this is the era of the time they're united fully under one geopolitical entity we're all german we're all playing by the same cards and the only people that aren't is those damn austrians so germany and austria have a very antagonistic relationship when it all kind of starts off here's what happens that changes one france and R russia doesn't really get schmoozed by the germans to be friends anymore and there's some geopolitical instances that actually uh push the russians away from the holy alliance and that was an alliance between the germans the austrians and the russians to basically maintain the power of the monarchies within central and eastern europe but also keep the balance of power between the three because they largely agreed wherever the borders were at the time that was fine um germany liked you know it was a new state they didn't really want to go to war and fight over Poland, as an example, whenever they had just finally formally put themselves together. Austria was literally starting at this point to tear itself apart because it was this multi ethnic empire in an era of nationalism and ethnocentrism where the Hungarians wanted to go their own way and these people wanted to go their own way and these people wanted to go their own way. And so Austria is basically on the decline at this point and while it actually is still technically geopolitically growing is that within, within the empire it's falling apart. Russia is basically a back or is basically a backwards uh, technological doorstop. Uh, excuse me, I'm getting a little tired. Oh, I forgot I have water. This is why I brought water. Excuse me. Okay, Russia at this point is basically a technological backstop. It's the same thing that we talked about in the Russian history episode. Every now and again, they'll kind of like technologically advance and they'll get on parity with everybody else, but then they'll fall behind socially, technologically, and to the point where they're kind of an old, just an old doorstop. Sorry about that. I really needed that. Okay. What eventually happens here is that the Russians could contend with the Germans, but they have their own multi ethnic structures. They're really having trouble socially with bringing themselves into some modern, some modern viewpoints. They have served them until like 1860s, like 1866, uh, which is basically feudalism. So socially they're really far behind. And industrialization, that's another thing entirely. They're way behind. And even when you get, when you get into World War I, uh, which is obviously in 19, starting in 1914, the Russians may have industry, they may have iron weapons and guns and cannons and shit, 
but they don't have the war industry that they need to really put themselves forward, and they're buying weapons from just about anybody and everybody who will supply them. Uh, and the Russians just absolutely get the crap kicked out of them when the war starts. Uh, we're not to World War I yet, but in a nutshell, here's what ha- or here's how we get there. The French and the Russians eventually are doing their own thing. The French hate the Germans. That's never going to change because they feel like they, Alsace and Lorraine cannot be in the hands of Germany for them to be friends. Germany feels the same way. So that's never going to work. Um, Britain was largely fond, fond of the Germans until the Germans started saying, yes, I'm going to build a navy to rival the British, so if I need to fight them, I can. I'm going to build my own colonial empire. Uh, that rapidly destroyed the relationship, and that was a really poor move on the Germans' part. Again, they don't do diplomacy well. Uh, and honestly, it made no sense anyway. Germans are a land power. They're surrounded by enemies on all sides. What the hell are you building a navy for? Quick answer, empire. Um, if, if the Germans couldn't collect it on Europe, they figured they'd go off and beat the hell out of somebody in Africa or Asia. Wasn't entirely wrong, but the problem is you were never going to breach the British Navy. And they what they should have done is that... It would, it would have been really easy to have a German-British alliance that would have lasted the test of time. Germany would have been the, the strong power within Europe that would have said, hey, look, continent is us. You guys got the Navy. You can have the overseas empire. You back us up. We back you up. You're good. That could have been an easy, easy thing. But the Germans completely screwed up the diplomacy on every major, ra- or on every major round. Okay, cool. And so... Uh, you get that. Russia largely starts seeing Germany as an antagonist because the Germans won't play ball with anything on them. Uh, and they're just, they're not helping each other. And so Germany's getting stronger and stronger. Russia's basically lagging further and further behind and uh, basically gets scared shitless of the Germans. Uh, you also have the Crimean War and a few other things that happen that just uh, make the Russians really uh, not wanting to play ball with anybody, to be completely honest. But uh they get scared, and they develop an inferiority, inferiority complex. And of course, 1905, 1906, you get the Japanese, Russo-Japanese War, and this new kid on the block, which isn't Germany, which is now called Japan, will decisively defeat the Russian Navy and defeat them in the Far East. So Russia is scared of the new kids on the block. They're basically become the antiquated old man of Russia or of Europe, and uh, they're scared shitless that they're going to be the next Ottoman Empire. Uh, And so to a large degree, they start uh, making alliances with the people on the other side of the continent, that being the French, and unironically kind of being the the British at some point. Uh, Although the the relationship between the British and the Russians is antagonistic uh, before World War I. Let's hit the other two real quick. Um, I don't know what time I'm on. I need to check that real quick. Uh, Wow, we're almost at an hour. Uh, 58 minutes. Okay, it's cool. Let's wrap this up. Uh, because I'm not going to cover War One. that's going to be its own individual episode, which I'm probably going to record here in just a minute anyway. Okay, so you have Germany. Um, oh, sorry, you have Austria. Austria is one of the uh, few left. Austria is in decline, but they basically start looking at the Germans like, hey, we're in Central Italy, or I'm sorry, we're in Central uh, Europe, we're surrounded by enemies on all sides, no one likes us, we have some col- common cultural heritage because, you know, our leadership and our rulers are German, you guys are German, let's just kind of treat this as an extension of you, help us reinforce, we'll help con- maintain security and peace throughout Central Europe, we'll back each other up, we'll be good to go. And so that becomes a relationship in a, um, uh, guten talk, wie geht's? Um, anyway, uh, and thank you for the follow, by the way. Anyway, um, so Austria largely is operating under that regard. Italy largely signs on with the, what is known as the Central Entente, which is um, an alliance between Germany and Austria to maintain peace in Central Europe. Italy actually signs on for this originally, uh, although eventually the relationship between Austria and Italy breaks down as World War One kicks off. Um, and then you have one more one more um, nation here, which is the Ottoman Empire. They've been basically falling apart for a while. They're the sick man of Europe. They've lost most of their European territories going into World War One, And um, for a while, they'll stick it out for the better part of the first year, but then they'll side with the central powers, um, and they'll try to help them out. So this gets us into World War I. Now, there's going to be a World War One episode. I have yet to do that, but I'm probably going to record that either today or within the next, like, two days. 
Uh, and that'll be the next geopolitical episode, actually before we even do Poland, because uh, it's been asked, it's been needed, and uh, yeah, we already did World War II, and I just, I need to knock out World War I, because it's a huge episode into itself. So, what largely happens throughout World War I for the Germans, the Germans will, will behave incredibly competent. They will, like, single-handedly just destroy the Russians. Uh, the Austrians and the Ottomans and against the Russians absolutely get manhandled. Uh, just because um, all, all of them are relative parity, technologically speaking, between the Austrians, the Russians, and the Ottomans. Uh, they're all socially inept. They're all basically backward states. Germany, uh, and, and so it's basically the Russian horde versus these discombobulated states. Germany basically comes in as a modern geopolitical military entity and just wipes the floor with the Russians. Not to say that the Germans won't have it easy. They're not. But they're able to just absolutely hand, manhandle the Russians. Again, by 1918, they're able to force them out of the war. This, all at the same time, while handling the French and the British in northern France. The good thing for the Germans that actually really helped them during the war is that they invaded northern France uh, when the war kicked off. And so while they were stopped before they could get to Paris, they largely knocked m half, if not more, of the French military industry offline because most of the steel mills and most of the iron ore and the coal mining in France is in the northern part near the Belgian border. All of this was largely taken out or occupied or conquered, if you will, by the Germans in the first months of the war, and they'll have it all the way into the last months of the war. So France largely, while being a political entity that can fight Germany, loses a significant amount of its industrial and military ability to counteract the Germans. And they're basically putting their themselves balls to the wall to hold off the Germans. So, in a nutshell, you have the British and the French hunkered down into Flanders in northern France, fighting off the Germans, while the Germans are also fighting off the Russians and beating them decisively, almost at every go. And, uh, yeah, the Germans just make a really good accounting for themselves. Uh, they basically handle France, Britain, and Russia relatively all at the same time. And they're winning against one and holding parity, with the other two. Now, granted, Britain doesn't bring all of its forces against uh, the Germans here, and France is also doing things elsewhere. But for basically what is a one-on-one -on -one fight, or more or less if you want a two-on-one fight, the Germans are doing this very well, and they're beating, they're just def decisively defeating the Russians by doing the vast majority of the work. And also, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one fight against the French and the British, they're holding, they're holding strong. So. In a nutshell, Germany makes a really good accounting for itself here. Um, <clears throat> getting out of World War One, the problem is, is that it's not so much that the Germans really lose this. Um, there's a reality here that I have to get into. What happens is, in 1918, things progress very rapidly. The Germans are able to knock the Russians out of the war. Uh, apart from in, or political manipulation where they bring Lenin in to uh, stir up the revolution. Eventually that happens and they sign a peace treaty. Uh, but uh, Germany has basically either annexed or now openly controls everything uh, that is Ukraine and Belarus and the Baltic states all the way over to France. So Germany is really strong at this point. And they have largely ample amount of resources and food. Uh, are, are basically areas that they can grow food now because they have Ukraine as part of the mix. The problem is, is that the German economy has been stagnating because the British have blockaded it and the they lost all their colonies in the best in the first months of the war, and uh, they were reliant upon their overseas territories and, and trade with particularly the United States in order to get the things that they couldn't get because they didn't have it in Central Europe and they didn't have it as an empire or even under the imperial possessions. What this largely does is that it slowly grinds the German economy down as it goes. And so while it's able to maintain a really effective war machine is that a lot of consumer goods and even access to food gets questionable at times. And always whenever you go to war and if you're fighting in the places that grow the food, particularly Central Europe, it makes, it makes food reliability really scarce. And eventually you'll have a famine or two that actually starts kicking off. Uh, particularly in 1918, where people are just having trouble getting food in the German Empire. And so, domestically, support for the war really starts collapsing. Um, what also happens, the Ottomans will eventually be defeated by a coalition of the Russians. Um, 
the British and the French. Mar- the British are the ones that do most of the work. But the Ottomans were always, were really weak at this point going into the war, and they're just basically formally defeated in late 1917 and 18 to where they basically disintegrate as an entity. And um, you have the rise of the Re- uh, Republic of Turkey, uh, and that's a civil war unto itself. Uh, you also have the Austrians will largely be comp- not competent, but they'll largely put up a good fight for what they can during the war. But by 1918, they're absolutely exhausted. Um, the, the political instability within the empire is about to rip it apart. And what happens is that they're able to knock out almost all of their, uh, contenders except for the Italians and the Greeks. The Greeks are almost completely wiped out, but they need Germany to help put, put them, put, put the final nail in. Germany just can't spare it. Uh, you also have, uh, Italy, which the Austrians and the Germans together will help really do some damage on Italy, but Austria is just on too many fronts. And even with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, they have to re they have to um, excuse me they have to re redeploy their forces in a particular way that stretches them way too thin. And even with taking troops off the line with the Russians, because the Russians are now out of the war, what eventually happens is that the Italians are able to counterattack. The Brits are able to re redraw forces that they can pull out from their Ottoman territories that they had been waging there. They put them in Greece, and all of a sudden Austria has to start folding. Uh, either the political divisions or the military competency just starts getting the better of them. And by the better part of uh, July of 1918, Austria is, whether figuratively or literally, just out of the war. And so it's basically Germany versus all the Allies. And of course, in 1917, a new ally had joined the war, and that's the Americans. And the Americans haven't really paid dividends yet because the Americans weren't equipped for war, they weren't ready. Um, and so, and they they didn't really even have much of a standing army. And so, most of 1917, they're out. The reason why the Germans are so crazed at this point is that they have to go for broke. They defeated the Russians in the beginning of 1918. They're losing allies really, really quickly. Basically, they're passing out. And so, Germany has one last chance to knock the war out before it's completely untenable. And so, in the summer of 1918, before the Americans can fully get there in force, Germany launches an all-out a strategic offensive in France and knock France out of the war and force a basically a, a piece that they can deal with. They get really close. They get really close. The problem with it is twofold. One, the Germans really start realizing at this point that tanks are the future. Um, originally at the part of the war, originally in 1916 when tanks came on, they thought that um, they were a neat idea, but you could take them out with large machine guns. Or you could take them out with light artillery. And so they weren't too much of a problem. But if you put them in flanks of 200 or 300 and you just move them as a giant mechanized assault, even though they're slow and unreliable and uh, you can puncture them with heavy machine guns, it got to a point where the Allies demonstrated that if you get enough of them, you can break over some of these trenches and you can have armored infantry roll through and take over. And this is the one thing that the Germans don't have. They've got the storm... They got the stormtroopers, which are the infantry component of that, and they're really, really good, and they're really, really competent, and they have demonstrated this both on the Eastern Front and the Western Front, and particularly when they're reinforced from troops in the Eastern Front, and they're familiar with the mobile tactics of the Eastern Front. Once they can break through, they're actually able to make significant gains, and the Germans will actually push more land and more troops and more forces through in early ni- or in mid-1918 than had been done at any point in the war since then. And so the Germans are showing that they have strength, capability, and flexibility to the point where they almost break the war completely open. What pro- the problem is, is that it, it might be tanks, it might be not, we're not, it's really debated. This is a big uh, World War I history buff thing. German, the German offensive stalls, again, largely right before it gets to Paris. And it's largely because they're going up against the French, the British and the Americans all at the same time, and everyone's just digging in. This is the fight. And Germany does very well. They push to a point, but they can't re they, they can't maintain their momentum, and they actually get overstretched in one particular era. The French in a in a large er, the French in one decisive movement are able to counterattack, and the Germans have to go on a defensive. The problem here is that it, it's not that the Germans are out of the war here, but nearly that they can't maintain getting the initiative back. And eventually what will happen is is that the French, the Americans, and the British 
we'll start launching counterattacks with these armored offensive with these new tanks that we were talking about in mass assaults and they start pushing the Germans back again and again and again and so the ga- the war becomes mobile uh, finally after four years um, the issue that that leads to is that the Germans are all alone all they're going to see from this point out is that the British, the Americans, and the French are going to get stronger and stronger and stronger, and they're going to move more forces and more troops into their into the theater, and Germany just openly figures that they can't win that. Um, even if they basically bonsai charge, just fighting this war would be completely pointless. There's almost no way they can win against the, the combined powers of three imperial great power rivals, one of which is the biggest economic power in the world, the, the index is the biggest colonial power in the world, and three is their arch rival. All of that together, they just can't beat. Uh, at least not alone. And so, what largely happens is that uh, with the political instability that's growing at home because people are having trouble getting food, and they are basically just have no way of building out any kind of bigger, uh, bigger thing, they sign for an armistice. Uh, in the uh, excuse me, in the fall or winter of 1918, and on November 11th, uh, you have an armistice assigned, and you eventually will get the Treaty of Versailles. I'm sorry, I'm being long-winded, but this is an hour and ten minutes already, and we're not even to World War II. I'm glossing over a lot of this when I do the when I do the World War One episode. Check that out. Uh, if you're record if you're watching this a week after it goes live here on YouTube, you might actually be able to see that episode up. Uh, so feel free to look after that. And of course, we're about to get to World War II. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a little drain engine crap going on because rain and weather is getting nasty. Um, okay, so Germany loses. And um, they have a significant amount of uh, change that happens. Okay. Um, what largely happens is the French get back what they want. And what the Allies want to do is they want to punish Germany to the point where they... If they launch another war, it's going to be hard for them. Now, there's a lot of misnomers and bullshit that is said about World War uh, One in the Vienna in the uh, um, excuse me the Treaty of Versailles. Here's the big one: the Treaty of Versailles is openly said throughout history that it is like incredibly punishing on Germany, and the entire point of the uh, of the treaty is to make it to where Germany can never fight a war again. Somewhat true, somewhat not true. In the general terms of what we had seen throughout history, the Treaty of Versailles is largely in tandem with what we've seen. There's huge indemnities and reparations to be paid. There's some territory that's exchanged or you know moved out, and um, you have um, what is it? Money, territory, and uh, a, a general reordering of what's going on. Uh, it's on a bigger scale than what we had seen up to this point. Force limits. It's not EU4. Um, it's on a bigger scale than at any point that we had seen uh, to this era. But when you had just fought the most bloody and biggest war in history, that was to be expected. Germany does have a significantly strong peace treaty levied against it. But if the if they really wanted to, the Allies could have fundamentally broke Germany back in 1919 and literally tore it apart. They didn't do that. Um, uh, didn't they have a cap placed on the military size? Yes, they did. Uh, but that's actually a lot more common than most people think that it is. Uh, usually, whenever, whenever you would have the reparations and the indemnities, you were forced to have a reduced military presence until it was paid off. And basically, the argument from the, the occupying army or the people that forced that upon you was, hey, look, you don't have to pay for your defense. We'll, def- we'll pay for your defense for you. You just have to pay us all of what you owe us, and then we'll leave, and you can go back to normal. Um, the problem with uh, what that treaty was is I don't believe that it was actually stipulated within the Treaty of Versailles where that was going to happen in Germany. And, of course, the real problem was with the size of the indemnity that Germany was supposed to pay, along with all the economic problems that fell in suit, Germany just couldn't pay it off. And so, to a large degree, you eventually have French troops occupy the Rhineland and particularly the Royal Pocket, and they'll literally almost steal like a lot of the German industry and German economic output for the better part of three years just to make indemnities. And eventually, you'll have the Americans step in right before the Great Depression. They'll be like, "Hey, look, we got to renegotiate this, otherwise Germany's going to fall apart." And 
if you think World War One was bad, think about a Germany that's in collapse um, because no one wanted to actually pick up their guns again after that disaster. And so you have uh, Germany re reallocate what the, what they're doing. And here's the the great irony, if you will. During the Weimar Republic of the late of the late twenties, Germany actually starts putting itself back together. It was it was nasty. It was bloody. They almost got to civil war once or twice, but by by 1928, Germany is becoming somewhat stable. The Weimar Republic actually is having a functioning democ de democratic government. It's working pretty well. The economy is starting to get back on the mend, and people are starting to find some level of normalcy in Germany. And then uh, Black Tuesday, October 1929, or uh, sorry, October of 1929 comes through, and you have the Great Depression in the United States. Germany's biggest trading partner at this point is the United States because they no longer have an empire and they are no longer able to access the resources on the open market that they really need to. The only people that are openly willing to trade with them in a, in a large, and large, large and capable manner is the Americans because the Americans love making money and they love trading with people. And so when the American economy goes offline, it drags Germany back down with it. And you have a level of political instability that makes the, the end of World War I look terrible. Or, I'm sorry, look tame. Excuse me. And eventually, Germany is at the hands of another possible civil war. And you actually definitely get into every qualification of civil strife. The problem is, people lose faith in the central government. That is the central parties. That is the SPD and Zinstrom and what have you. Um, and they all, or not all, but the, a large contingent of the population either decide that they're going to swing hard right, and that is the NSDAP, otherwise known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party, otherwise known as the Nazis, or the basically the communist branch. Within the period of, a, of two years, the Nazis and the communists in Germany will triple in size. So extremism takes hold big time in, in Germany. And so it's basically one of those deals where the, the centrists... The normal, the liberals, uh, the conservatives, they're all completely shoved out of the, uh, of the conversation. And it becomes a knockdown, drag out political fight between the Nazis and the communists on who's going to bring the direction forward for Germany. And eventually, what will largely happen is through a bit of political maneuvering and a bit of uh, PR, the Nazis will win this. Now, there's a long story of this. I'm going to make it short. Um, what happens is in 1932, I think it is, 1932, 1933, the Nazis win in the, in the elections. They're not the majority party, but they are the biggest party. Um, and the communists are like right on their heels. <clears throat> what eventually um, is kind of figured out here, um, what eventually, um, yeah, what eventually were, is figured out here is that the central government is trying to maintain legitimacy and they're largely trying to keep things within control. Everyone hates the communists because the communists are seen as a general, um, you know, this is the era of the Red Scare. Uh, they're, they're seen as uprights. They're going to tear down the social order of Europe. So no one's in favor of this. The Nazis are crazy, but they seem to be at this time just radical conservatives. And so what, the, what happens is that the central government more or less legitimizes the Nazis. They bring Hitler in as chancellor and the president, which is uh, Paul von Hindenburg, largely just says, hey, look, I'm going to keep you in check. You're going to be chancellor. You're going to you know, help maintain this. You're going to build a right-wing coalition government that keeps the left in check. We're going we're gonna to hold this down. We're going to build Germany back up. For the better part of a year, that actually works. I I, I hate getting in this because people are going to call me a Nazi sympathizer. I know. I, I see it coming. Here's what happens. Hitler's deranged. Absolutely. But he most of the shit that people think that he's going to end up doing, most people don't think he's actually going to do. Now, granted, some of the shit he says in Mein Kampf, but it's one thing where politicians say shit and don't do it versus when they're, you know they are actually going to do something. Of course, politics is then as it is now. When people say crazy-ass ludicrous shit, half the time you don't believe them, and a lot of people felt, felt that way about Hitler. The problem was is that in 1934, Paul von Hindenburg dies. The guy was old as hell. Um, 
Uh, Warhead, be careful with that, man. Um, usually they find that, like, Twitch finds that TOS. Okay. What eventually happens here is, um, Hitler, um, does a little bit of political maneuvering. Like, right before, uh, Hindenburg dies, the Reichstag catches fire. Now, most likely what it was is there was a drunken guy who was being a jackass. He literally went in the building and torched the place. But Hitler blames the communists. And he's able to convince Hindenburg, because Hindenburg doesn't like the communists anyway, to help outlaw the communist party. So the, the German right largely gets everything at once anyway. And so they, they figure that they're on the pathway just to peace and stability because the, the crazy-ass lefties have been now put in, their, put in a box. They're now outlawed as a political party. They have to co consolidate under the SPD or some other, uh, some other party that is more... Uh, moderate, I guess. And so, um, things are going the way that largely the moderates and the people that are in charge want them to, outside of the crazy people being, like, legitimized in the government. But they're like, all right, cool, we got rid of one side, now we can get rid of the other. Right at that time, Hindenburg dies. And this is where the plot basically goes off the rails. Hitler is chancellor at this point, and he's able to convince, now that his political opposition has been completely neutered, the Nazis are now the number one force politically within the country, and the moderate conservatives can't hold a candle to the, to the far right. And so Hitler's able to convince the Nazi party to give him both the powers of the chancellorship and the presidency, and by 1935, Hitler is now Fuhrer, and that is basically the leader of Germany, uh, and that's basically how it's translated into. Um, and so now he's basically a, a, a dictator. And uh, over the next three to five years, you will see Crystal Knocked and all this shit uh, that eventually brings the rise of the horrors and atrocities of what we find is Nazi Germany. Okay. Um, I don't know what's going on in chat. Just behave yourselves. Uh, and if you guys have questions or comments, feel free to do it because this is one of those sensitive things. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be um, misquoted or thought of as saying something I don't mean to say. But anyway, in a general sense here, what what does happen is that uh, Germany is trying to put itself back together again. There's some there's some risky deals made, and just right where bad things don't need to happen, bad things happen once again, and you get the rise of one of the most heinous authoritarian systems that we have ever seen in human history and here's the real problem germany finds a level of stability under the nazis now granted it's easy to be politically stable when you've basically outlawed any and all other parties and that eventually happens by 1936 but here's one thing that really does hurt uh, politically speaking is that the nazis are able to basically put germany the german economy back on its feet um, they are economic centrists they take levels of government, uh, the government spending and in uh, policy control, and they're able to build out works programs to put Germans back to work. Very similar to what FDR and Mussolini will do, but also at the same time is that basically anyone who disagrees with them, they just eat them into a, into a concentration camp. And so with the absence of political dissent and the rising of economic fortunes within Germany, Germany, the Nazis actually become incredibly popular. Uh, and this is one of those things that the Germans actually try to revise. It's like, oh, well, I wasn't really a Nazi, or we didn't really like them or all this. And they're only 10% of the people who are actually part of the Nazi party. Nazis had massive approval ratings going into the late 1930s. Uh, didn't they spend a lot? I thought they were gaining more debt. Yes, they did. Uh, they, spent, uh, they spent an absolute shit ton. It was a massive public works program, very much similar to FDR. A lot of public spending, a lot of road construction, a lot of all this stuff. Uh, that helped kind of put Germany back on its feet. And yeah, it made Germans indebted. But, you know, politically speaking, uh, you know, it's the same thing every time. Germ people love uh, basically putting everything on the credit card and passing it off to the next generation. And Germany was doing that. Absolutely. Uh, the problem is that uh, Germany decided he wanted to go to war with everybody. And so I'm going to skip over World War II to a large degree. Just check out the World War II episode. It's two and a half hours uh, of just content. But... In a general sense, so we're not turning this into a two-hour hour episode. Uh, eventually, Germany rearms, reindustrializes, and uh, Germany is really pissed off after all of the things that happened after World War One, and so they're going to kick off another war 
to uh, basically reassert their geopolitical influence on Europe. There is a lot I can say about that, but in a general sense here is that they win most of the battles, but they win, they lose the war. And it eventually comes to, not only is Germany punished once, but Germany is eventually punished twice. Granted, I don't think they really deserved the first time nearly as bad, but that was in within normalcy. The second time, when you when you are basically the main perpetrator in Europe that openly starts the bloodiest and most nasty conflict in human history, this is the modern borders that you end up with. Okay, long story short, we're going to jump over that. Um, Germany is absolutely, basically throws an all-out gambit uh, of World War II to you, you basically assert German dominance on the European theater. Um and they get really close to doing so. They decisively free, defeat the French in six weeks, um, which is great, or great for them, excuse me. Um, they decisively bring Poland into the fold within six weeks, and then they launch the, the final war against Russia, but obviously between Russia and a few other things that they lose. What happens here is that you'll notice that all of these areas that used to be German in the eastern, in the east, or central Europe, is now part of Poland. <clears throat> What the Russians will do is that they are so pissed off at the Germans, um, and rightfully so, they will lose uh, three out of every 20 people within Russia will die during World War II. Uh, they're so pissed off that they will f systematically punish Germany. Anything east of the modern border of Germany is G-Germanized. Everyone is basically told to pack their shit and go. Uh, and basically, you'll have the rise of East and West Germany. I don't have a map here, but... Uh, you guys may be very, very familiar. The borders, feel free to look it up. Uh, basically, um, the, the map of Central and Eastern Europe is completely redrawn by the Russians or the Soviets. Uh, the Germans are absolutely and harshly punished uh, by uh, the communists and, or the Russians uh, so that they lose a lot of, uh, a lot of their eastern tracks. And they, the Soviets make it, or the Russians make it to where they cannot possibly pose a threat to them, at least within two or three lifetimes. Um, uh, yeah, GDR, absolutely. Um, that's the German Democratic Republic and the German Federal Republic, the Federal, uh, German Republic. Um, but anyway, what eventually will happen is you have the Cold War, East versus West, uh, Eastern New Germany is basically sapped of any and all strength that it possibly can, and it's only after the Marshall Plan that the Soviets actually were like, oh, well, we have to bribe everybody to try to stay on our side, so they... Try to turn East Germany into a client state that actually is willing to stay on. You have eventually it gets so bad that you had the Berlin Wall because everyone's trying to flood into West or West Germany. Um, the West treats Germany really nice, all things considered. Uh, whether that's deserving or not, I'll leave to you. But it's largely Western Germany that will become the economic and central powerhouse of Europe that it is today. Uh, and it's largely, in a nutshell, this is what Germany becomes. It becomes a pacifist nation that even during the height of the Cold War will only have about 500,000 troops in uniform to defend itself against the hordes of the Soviets. So put that in context. They could have easily put 2 million men in a uniform, you know, and reservists ready to fight at any given point. They didn't. Washington, the L or NATO largely said, nope, you're not doing that. Um, you can have a decently large, a decent standing army, but nothing that is strong enough to ever invade anybody else. And what you're going to do is you're just going to be part of the coalition. Focus on other stuff. Focus on the economy. Focus on your political stability. Build a Germany that you can be proud of. And they did. Germany, uh, by 1985, is one of the strongest countries economically in Europe. And once you have political unification, even though it will cost them a trillion euros to put it together... And even with all of that going on where East Germany still today isn't nearly as wealthy or as prosperous as West Germany, Germany unified after 1990 is stupidly strong. It is, I think, third or, no, what is it? I think it's the fourth biggest economy in the world right now uh, in nominal terms and fifth in purchasing power. Germany's stupidly powerful uh, on an economic front. Politically, it's doing pretty well. And, um... You know, militarily, it's pretty much disarmed. If you want to see where Germany is right now, what's going on with everything, you know, at this point, go check out the, the Country Spotlight episode on Germany. We just did that one not too long ago. Uh, it went live. You guys seem to really like that episode. So uh, Germany's got some problems that's going on right now, but economically speaking, they're just an absolute hammer blow. 
What's the future, Jeremy? Well, we'll get there in a second. Uh, let me just uh, tag on to what's going on in chat because you guys had some comments that I wanted to hit up. Um, okay, uh, the yellow is largely filled uh, with de denazification too. Uh, or at least, de yeah, de I think you missed the A there. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think they did a pretty good job, but that's me. Um, many old political leaders went straight to the West uh, to fight the Reds. To some degree, that's true. You have Operation Paperclip and whatnot, where Otto von Braun ends up being basically the guy who helps build NASA. Uh, but to a large degree, what you have here is that anyone who is like super in depth with the Nazis and basically committed like the most heinous of atrocities, they're basically killed during the Nuremberg trials. Anyone who actually is kind of respected by by the Western Allies um, for either competency or for not being neck deep in the atrocities, such as Heinz Guderian. Uh, it eventually becomes consultants for building the West German military. So, yes, no, maybe so. Uh, I, I guess that's a bigger uh, side quest, I guess, that we can get into. Uh, the East took in former German generals, too. Both sides started uh, taking in whoever they could. To some degree, that's true. To some degree, it's not. Um, to a large degree, to the East, basically anyone anyone who became any, any kind of prominent in the East, or prominence in the East, largely was uh, dictated by Moscow. Uh, the West was a lot more hands-off regarding that. Okay, uh, let's finish this out so that we don't go forever. What is the future of Germany? Well, um, I hate this, but we're almost back to the 1920s again. Uh, Germany, demographically speaking, uh, as we talked about in the country spotlight, is really looking rough. Uh, they've got a bunch of old people that are going to be retiring in the next 10 to 15 years, and once that happens, the entire economic system in Germany... Uh, goes into question, and that's bef that's not counting COVID or a more uh, politically isolationist and nationalistic world that we're walking into. So, in the event that we w w wake up tomorrow, that the world is becoming more nationalistic, where people aren't trading as much, uh, and the economic security of Germany is within question, they've got five years to build out a whole new military or a whole new political system. That will say we're going to take a destiny into our own hands, and this is something that I and of course uh, Peter Zion have been uh, are very afraid of. Is um, you know, 1934 Germany is putting itself together after the Great Depression, and in 1940 it's invading France. Um, Germany, if it wants to, within the next five years, decides that it wants to change radically its approach on how it's going to handle something. It absolutely can, and let's just be honest here. We're talking about the Germans here. These are people of action. These are people that dis distinctly throughout history, if they need to get something done or they want to, they, they are efficient and they are competent at getting it done. I am very afraid uh, that while the Germans do not have the officer, the Prussian officer corps that they needed, that they need to really put uh, a military back together in the way that they could, they did after World War One, they have the technological and economic know-how to really build some nasty ass shit. That in the event that they want to politically and economically and military, militarily start throwing away, not throwing away, but throwing their weight around in Europe that makes everybody nervous as hell, that's not a hard sell. And remind you that AFD, which is basically a, a very far right wing party within Germany, while it did take a hit in the last election, is pulling 10%. That's, that's not... That's not outlandish. And in a, what, basically what I'm putting here is this. In the event that the German economy comes into question, where people are scared that they're going to lose their jobs or not, they're not going to have any kind of security coming down the line, and that's going to be a big conversation coming up here in a few years, you could see a hardline pull to the right and left, very much akin to what we saw back in the 1920s after the Great Depression. I'm afraid of this, and I'm pretty sure it's coming. And Germany very well could find themselves literally right back in the 1930s. Might not take the same form. You might not have the, the a ASDP. Um, but uh, to a large degree, what what I am looking at is that uh, I don't think it'll be Delenka. I think it'd actually be the Greens. But it, you, we, you could have a knockdown political structure between uh, um, de Grun and uh, the AFD on who controls Germany in a... Um, uh, what the future is. Now, I would love to see a more liberal and moderate Germany going forward, but 
if the Russians decide to play hardball when it comes to energy policy or the Americans say that they're going to play hardball when it comes to trade, it's over. The, the Germans will absolutely have political and economic contractions and contusions that will fundamentally change everything and how they operate. And the political reaction to that will be akin to what they saw back in 1929. Okay. Uh, two things there as far as chat that'll hit. Uh, I don't feel that a like AFD has anyone they can form a coalition with. Uh, I, unfortunately, that's now changed. If AFD gets an, a sizable votership with, um, it's going to be up to the CDU. The CDU is just going to have to make a choice whether they're going to deal with them or not. Right now, the CDU doesn't want to even remotely entertain that idea because they will feel that will give them legitimacy. But what what is very likely to happen, or very possible, in the event that when these party negotiations are done and you have a left-wing government form where you have SPD, Greens, and FDP get together, if that were to happen, the CDU is going to be really pissed because they're still the second biggest party in the country. And the next time we have a snap election, which probably won't be five years from now, the next time we have an election, if you have a stronger right wing and they want to counter the left, you may see a CDU that is far more willing to entertain the AFD in, in a coalition, particularly if either one of them picks up voter share. So yeah, the, the Germans could easily change their mind on that. And I, I hate to entertain that, but this isn't the first time we've seen this. Uh, AFT could easily become a, a significant political power within Germany. And they kind of already are. They're put, while, while they lost votership, remind you that they actually picked up more provincial seats. Uh, they took over most of Saxony and they took most of Thurga too in this election. Which the good, I guess the better news is as far as MPs being elected in, prov in provincial elections, um, yeah, votership's down this, this time, but the provincial uh, allocation was actually higher uh, for AFD. So they're getting stronger in some regards. Keep an eye on AFD. Um, hopefully they'll go a different way. Very careful. Uh, AFD should be banned. Well, the good news is for Germany is they don't have political protections in the same way that uh, um, uh, that the United States does, uh, particularly when it comes to freedom of speech. If the Germany wants to shut this down, they actually can. They could. I don't know if they can outright ban AFT with their new constitu with the constitution they have after forty five, um, but they don't have freedom of speech laws. Um, so yeah, uh, banning parties is bad. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that either. Um, but anyway, uh, Germany is going to have a lot to get into. Uh, as far as if they should ban AFT, I don't. I don't know. Uh, if anything, what's likely to happen is all the AFD voters will flood it in the CDU, and it just makes the CDU more right-wing. Um, so I, I might have to go with Ant on that one. That that actually could hurt more. Uh, Ant, are you who I think you are, actually? Mm, no, you're not. <clears throat> okay, um, STP gonna love uh, or love going after extremists. Um, I'm very interested to see what the SPD does. I I would think the smart move is to go with a voter call is to partner with the CDU again uh, and try to maintain a moderate government because anything they do to to legitimize the Greens is gonna hurt them in the end. Um, all right. So without further ado, I think this largely wraps it up. Uh, the future of Germany is uh, unfortunately very questionable right now. Um, uh, I think the SPD CDU is very likely again. I do too. I think it's po very much possible because the relationship is definitely there. I talked about this in the country spotlight uh, for the, light, the last 10 minutes. But um, <clears throat> the SPD has all the connections with the CDU. And all they have to do is be like, hey, look, SPD is in charge now. We're going to get, you know, we're going to get five of the cabinet positions versus your four or three or whatever it was. And uh, we're gonna get we're gonna get like two major social policies through. We're we're still happy to have it, have you on board, but we're gonna be dictating more what this relationship is. And if you guys meet us, then you know we'll flip it back. But until then, let's have a central government. Or excuse me, a centrist government that is competent, professional, and kicks ass. And I think that what's the I think that's the smart play for the SPD, because anything they do to make the Greens more powerful just makes that makes the SPD look weaker. Um, but that might be the American in me. 
They're saying they're not going to, but I really don't believe them. Uh, I hope they do. I really do. Uh, I think they've already tied their fortunes to the CDU as it is. Um, I could be wrong here, but I think at this point, anything that they do, again, just helps the Green Party out at that point. And they, that's the big threat they need to do. Um, if the SPD doesn't deliver and show that they can lead the charge, you're probably going to have a lot of left-wing voters just switch from SPD to Green, and that's not something they want. Okay, uh, I think that largely wraps it up. So if you have any final questions in chat, you now is your time to do it. Uh, I thank everyone for being here. I If anyone is just like, oh, hey, you know, Tiberius, you didn't, you know, you know, I, I wanted to be a part of this one. Uh, I recorded this at 7 in the morning. It's actually 9 right now. Or, you know, I ended at like, started at like 7.40. But anyway, uh, this, actually, this video is actually supposed to be live 10 minutes ago, so I'm probably going to kill this off. But, um... Anyway, we're going to get this uploaded and taken care of. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, the stream is going to end, actually, on this one. I need to take a break. I need to basically re regroup and whatnot. But if you like what I do, if you're watching on Twitch, go check out the YouTube. Check out all my other stuff and all my other content. Um, it would really help because we're trying to build up the YouTube audience. And uh, if you're actually watching this on YouTube and watching the recording, feel free to uh, you know either have a Twitch account or get one and uh, give me a follow so that if you are wanting to catch this live, if you get a chance, you can uh, definitely jump on and, um, and join us. That would be appreciated. Anyway, without further ado, I am losing my voice, and I need to uh, basically consolidate and get this uploaded. So, good to see you guys all in chat. It's good to see you all uh, on the YouTube comments. Definitely let me know what you think. Contact me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. Or, excuse me. <coughs> oh, I can't breathe. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter if you want to get in contact with me personally just to talk about whatever. Or if you want to, you leave comments down below and all that. Let me know what you want to see, what you liked, what you didn't like. It's been appreciated, and we'll catch you next time.